911 operators have a very difficult and demanding job. There's no doubt that the 911 emergency system has saved many, many lives thanks to the training that their operators and dispatchers receive. But in January of 2008, the system failed, costing one woman her life and leaving her family questioning why she didn't receive the help she so desperately needed and begged for. The tale of 21-year-old Denise Amber Lee is one that's left many people frustrated, not only at the fact that her life was ended, but also because there were multiple chances for her life to be saved. Denise and her husband Nathan met while they were still in high school, Denise being 17 and Nathan being 19 at the time. As soon as they met, they knew they wanted to spend the rest of their lives together, and before long, they began talking about starting a family. They got married as soon as they could, and before long, they followed up on their dream by having two children, Noah and Adam. They decided that Denise would stay home to look after the boys. But to do this, Nathan had to work three jobs, but he did this with pleasure, since it meant that he could properly provide for his family. Nathan would later recall how during their very first Valentine's Day date, he'd gifted Denise a heart-shaped ring, which she loved so much that she literally never took it off. These two were truly in love, and their sons were the center of their lives. One of Nathan's jobs at the time was an electric meter reader, which is what he was doing on the afternoon of the 17th of January 2008. He left the family's home earlier than usual that morning, so early in fact that Denise and the boys were still asleep. He checked in with her later that morning at around 11 a.m., and she told him that she was out on the back porch of their house in North Point, Florida, with Noah while she was giving him a haircut. Nathan finished his shift at 3 p.m. and then headed home. While on his way, he called Denise once more, but this time he got no answer, which he found strange. But since Denise was looking after two young boys, there was a good chance that she just had her hands full. He eventually pulled into the house's driveway at 3.30 p.m., but that was the moment that his and his children's lives changed forever. Nathan walked into the house and looked for his wife, but couldn't find her anywhere. Even more perplexing was the fact that both Noah and Adam had been placed in the same crib, something they never did, and he immediately knew something was very wrong. Denise would never leave the two boys unattended, and she certainly wouldn't leave the house without them since Adam was just six months old. He checked on the boys and found them to be in perfect health, but he was baffled at where Denise could be. He looked for clues but found that all of her possessions were still in the house and could find no indication that she had left in a hurry. Everything in the house seemed in order, and from what he could see, it seemed as though she had just vanished into thin air. All the locks on the doors were intact, so no one had forced a lock to get in. Furthermore, Nathan had to unlock the front door to get in, so everything seemed secure. Fearing the worst, he looked around for signs that a struggle had taken place, but he found none as everything seemed in its place. But he couldn't shake the feeling that something was wrong, and as he'd started to grow ever more anxious, he decided to contact the police. He explained his situation, and a short while later, officers arrived at the house to investigate. They scoured through the building in search of anything that could tell them where Denise had gone but they also couldn't see anything that caused them too much concern, except for the fact that Denise was obviously missing. Deciding that there was nothing further to learn from the family's home, they spoke to the neighbors, and this is when the first worrying detail of Denise's case came to light. One neighbor reported that she'd seen a car, a green Camaro, driving very slowly up the street at about 2.30 that afternoon, an hour before Nathan arrived. It then left, but a short while later, she spotted it again, and added that she felt uneasy about the way that it was slowly moving through the neighborhood. It would drive to the top of the street, turn around, and then creep past the houses once more, repeating this process four or five times according to witnesses. It then pulled into the family's driveway, and when she looked through her window, she could see a man who she didn't recognize sitting behind the wheel. She would add that she saw the same car leaving the house about 10 minutes after it had stopped in the drive, and that the man still seemed to be alone, so she didn't think much more of it. While the officers were investigating, Nathan called Denise's father, Detective Rick Goff, and upon hearing what was going on, he made contact with several different law enforcement agencies, 
informing them that Denise was missing and that they needed to be on the lookout for her. By now, Nathan was beside himself with worry, as no word had been received from Denise. And with every passing hour, he became more convinced that something untoward had happened at the house while he was still at work. For almost three hours, they searched for Denise with the help of police dogs and helicopters and asked people in the area if they had seen anything, but to no avail. But then at 6.14 p.m., a 911 call was made to the Sarasota County Sheriff's Office. It was Denise. The operator heard a woman on the other side of the line, but for some reason couldn't understand that she was in a situation where she couldn't speak directly into the phone. The first words they heard from her were, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I just want to go. In recordings of the call, the operator can be heard repeatedly asking, hello, when Denise is heard saying, I'm sorry, I just want to see my family. This is a very strange way to start a 911 call, which, in the opinions of many, should have alerted the operator to the fact that someone had called them and was unable to give any details directly, since they were probably being held against their will. But while the caller, who turned out to be Denise, was doing her best to relay information, the operator would go on to ask, hello, a total of 10 times before realizing that they should have been listening to what was being said and done on the other side of the line. But before this happened, a man could be heard talking to Denise and not in a friendly way. He could be heard asking why she had done that, though we don't know what he was referring to. At one point, he could be heard asking Denise what she had done with his phone, as he was clearly searching for it, but she merely replied by saying, please let me go, please let me see my family again. The man then responds that this won't be a problem, but even then, the dispatcher could be heard once more asking, hello, which is just, I mean, wake up. This woman is clearly in need of help. Do something, literally anything. The man then states angrily that he was going to let her go free, but that she'd now done something that made him change his mind. 
Denise can be heard apologizing for whatever she did, after which the man is heard asking where his phone is. Unbeknownst to him, Denise had somehow managed to get a hold of it, after which she dialed 911. She then lay down on the back seat of the man's car, making sure that his phone was out of sight, and proceeded to try and get as much information from him as possible. She likely knew that this would be her only chance to get help, and bravely, she took a chance that could easily have saved her life, or made matters much worse. Denise then begs her captor to let her go several more times, but her pleas fall on deaf ears, as the man states that he would now have to drive to the next street, quote, because of him. Next, he could be heard asking Denise what she was doing and making mention of his cousin, Harold. It would later come to light that this is who he was referring to during the earlier part of the recording. Denise then asks him again to let her go, now clearly in a lot of distress at being abducted and held against her will, but quite unbelievably, the 911 operator simply replies, hello, yet again. It's only when Denise says, help me, that they seem to catch on to the situation, and they then ask for her address, which she obviously couldn't give without alerting her abductor to her plan. They could then be heard talking to their supervisor, stating that the call was coming from somewhere in Northport. Still, they kept asking her to give her address. When they finally ask her for her name, she's able to reply while duping the man into thinking that she's talking to him. She stated, my name is Denise. I'm married to a beautiful husband, and I just want to see my kids again. The first four words of that sentence were, my name is Denise, and yet the operator replied by asking, your name is Denise, rather than asking questions that she could answer without alerting her abductor. To their credit, it's at this point that the situation fully sank in and they told their supervisor that they believed the caller was talking to them while being careful not to give away the fact that she dialed 911. But the fact that it took the operator this long to realize this is just so far beyond comprehension. You can clearly tell within 10 seconds of this call that this poor woman cannot respond. The fact that it took the operator several minutes to catch on, there's just no excuse. Surely these people are trained for situations like this. But regardless, they asked Denise to press a button on the phone if she'd been blindfolded, but she was obviously unable to press any buttons. The operator then asked whether she knew the man she was with, but again received no response. Again, obviously. Instead, they could hear her and the man arguing about his phone while he was still trying to locate it. The operator then realizes that she must be lying on top of the phone or something, and that Denise couldn't hear any of the questions that they were asking at this point. Denise then pretended to help the man look for his phone, giving her the opportunity to hear the 911 operator for the first time. When asked whether she knows how long she'd been away from her house, she quietly responded, I don't know but had to repeat that answer twice more as they kept repeating the same question, despite having received a very clear answer. They then finally asked their first relevant question, which is, what is your last name? To which she immediately replied, Lee. The dispatcher's next question was to waste even more time by asking Denise to confirm that her name was in fact Denise Lee. Despite so much time being burned on this call, Denise seemingly managed to keep her wits about her and finally managed to get the operator to understand that this was indeed her name. She's then asked to identify the street that she's on, to which she replies that she can't. She also managed to relay that she didn't know the man who had abducted her and that she lived on Latour Street by stating, I don't know, please take me to my house. Can you please take me home on Latour, please? The last few sentences of this recording are of Denise asking the man whether he's going to hurt her, to which he demands for her to hand over his phone. She then asks if he'll let her go, and he states that he will as soon as he has his phone back. The call abruptly ends after the last sentence, which was Denise simply stating, help me. Thanks to the information that Denise was able to give, it was known that her name was Denise Lee and that she lived on Latour Street in North Point, and that she'd been kidnapped by a man who she'd never seen before in her life. This was a wealth of information, given the circumstances, and while efforts were made to trace the phone from which the call was made, they failed since it was a burner phone. But investigators were able to ascertain who the phone belonged to, and it soon came to light that the owner was a 36-year-old unemployed man named Michael Lee King. Officers were immediately sent to his house, but it was found to be empty. Just nine minutes after Denise dialed 911, a 17-year-old girl named Sabrina Muxlow also called 911 to report that her father had witnessed something that she felt needed to be reported. 
Her father's cousin, Michael, had arrived at their house at around 5.45 p.m. and asked to borrow a gas can, a flashlight, and a shovel. He stated that his lawnmower was stuck in the front yard and that he needed to get these items to get it free. They then gathered the requested items, but as soon as they walked towards King's car, a green Camaro, her father heard a woman screaming for him to call the police. He approached his cousin, asking what was going on, and he replied that it was nothing to worry about. He then saw King leaning over the car's center console and pushing someone in the back seat with shoulder-length blonde hair's head down and out of sight. His cousin then got back in the car and left. Feeling suspicious about what he had just witnessed, he decided to drive to King's house, and when he arrived, he realized that not only was there no lawnmower on the front lawn, but both King and his car were nowhere to be seen. He then also called 911 anonymously, giving a description of King's car and stating that he may have abducted someone who was still being held in the vehicle. A fourth 911 call was made by a woman named Jane Kowalski at 6.30 that evening. She told the operator that she was driving in her car and had stopped at a traffic light when she heard a high-pitched scream unlike any that she'd ever heard before. She realized that it was coming from the car next to her, and when she looked over, she locked eyes with King. He was once again trying to push Denise's head down into the back seat, but she then saw a hand come up from the back of the car and it started frantically banging against the window. Realizing that something was wrong, she pulled away from the light slowly, hoping that King would pull out in front of her, revealing his license plate number. But he seemingly realized what she was thinking and remained beside her. He then quickly changed lanes and eventually ended up behind her. While in the line with 911, King then turned onto Toledo Blade Boulevard, and Jane was unable to follow thanks to heavy traffic that was around her. Unfortunately, Jane's call fell on deaf ears, as no one was informed of what she had seen. Charlotte County dispatchers had somehow failed to link the calls to Denise's case, and despite several officers and deputies being in that area at that time, they were never given a description of King's vehicle or the direction that it was traveling in. But by now, investigators knew that they were looking for King and that he was keeping Denise captive in his green Camaro. Hence, a roadblock was put up at Toledo Blade Boulevard. Just after 9 p.m. that night, King drove into view and he was finally pulled over. King proved uncooperative and only exited his car after being threatened with one of the officer's firearms. When he emerged, they noted that his clothes were soaked from the belt down and that he had mud caked on his shoes. He was taken into custody, and when his car was searched, the burner phone was found, along with a dirty shovel, a gas can, and a heart-shaped ring. Denise was nowhere to be found, and they immediately feared the worst. King was told that the authorities knew that he had abducted Denise. He was charged with her kidnapping, but refused to give any details as to what had transpired after her 911 call. He merely stated that he had no idea what they were talking about. For the next two days, searchers scoured the areas where they knew Denise had been in hopes that she would be found, but these efforts would end tragically when one searcher on Plantation Boulevard stumbled across a patch of soil that seemed as though it had been disturbed. Here, Denise's body was found in a three-foot deep grave. An autopsy was performed and it was revealed that her life had been ended with a single round to the head. They also observed bruising on her wrists, indicating that she'd fought bravely against her attacker but unfortunately, they also found obvious evidence that she'd been taken advantage of as well. It was now apparent that King was responsible for Denise's death, and he was charged in the first degree, to which he obviously decided to plead not guilty, despite the mountain of evidence that had been gathered against him. The case seemed to be an open and shut one. Several people gave statements that they had seen King that day, either in the area around the family's house or on the road where he was driving his Camaro. Even his own cousin, Harold, knew that he was guilty and offered to testify against him in court. Furthermore, DNA samples were taken from the scene where Denise was found and they were matched to him. And since her hair and ring were found in his car along with one of her handprints on the outside of one of the windows, he didn't have a leg to stand on. The evidence only continued to mount when King's house was searched. Here, investigators found several pieces of duct tape that had some of Denise's hair stuck to it, but his defense team still did their utmost to prove his innocence. Since the firearm used to end Denise's life was never found, that posited the theory that anyone could have fired the shot and that it couldn't immediately be assumed that King had pulled the trigger. But this did little to sway the jury, though, as they took just two hours to deliberate and return a verdict of guilty. Honestly, though, the fact that it even took them two hours here is a little bit confusing. 
This resulted in King receiving capital punishment, which he appealed unsuccessfully. By now, the case had finally been solved, and in record time, too. But while Denise's attacker was set to pay for his heinous crime, it was Nathan, Adam, and Noah who were the real ones left with the punishment from this case, as they were now forced to come to terms with the fact that Denise's life could have been saved many times over had the appropriate information been sent to the correct people in a timely manner. If these witnesses had reached out even just a few minutes sooner, if the 911 operator had just used two brain cells during their call, Denise's life could have likely been spared. To do his best to stop this from ever happening again, Nathan founded the Denise Amber Lee Foundation, which provides better training for 911 operators. As for her father, Detective Rick Goff, he was involved in establishing the Denise Amber Lee Act, which provides voluntary training for those same operators, which kind of steps all over my previous point of saying, surely these operators are trained for these situations because apparently they're not. Denise's case has resulted in many changes as far as 911 operating training goes. They now receive at least six months of training and are taught how to properly use the technology that can pinpoint a caller's location, another useful tool that would have almost certainly saved Denise's life. Nathan stated during an interview that he remembers Denise for the selfless and caring person she was. He always admired the fact that she always put her children first and that she loved them unconditionally. But he stated that he'll never move on from the devastating tragedy left in the wake of King's heinous actions. For years after that fateful day, he struggled to move on with his life, but knew that he had to find a way for the sake of his children. He's now one of the foremost speakers on the changes that have been made to the 911 emergency system, having made the decision to make it his full-time career to inform as many people as possible how 911 is to be used and how operators are supposed to respond. But the road to this point was a long and tumultuous one. Nathan only realized long after the tragic events that he'd kept his emotions in check for far too long, since he wanted to be a good role model for his two sons. At times, he felt desolate and depressed, but forged ahead in hopes that he could stop a similar fate befalling anyone else. In the end, he decided to sue the Charlotte Sheriff's Office for their mishandling of the 911 calls that had been made that night. And in 2012, he settled for $1.25 million, and thank God for that, not because of the money, but because this will hopefully teach this department a very valuable lesson and lead to other departments taking notice so that this can be avoided in the future. He set some of that money aside as a college fund for the boys and then set his mind to creating the Denise Amber Lee Foundation. He bought a house in Inglewood, and today he lives there with Noah and Adam while using his desire for change in the 911 system as a driving force, along with his memories of the woman who he loved above any other. Denise's case is one that brings up feelings of frustration and anger, not only at the man who took her life that day, but the people who were responsible for dispatching help. And while I've been admittedly pretty harsh towards the 911 operator today, we have to always keep in mind that 911 operators are only human, and that they work in unbelievably stressful environments that most of us would struggle with. I'll gladly admit that it's not a job I would even be remotely interested in. With Nathan and the Denise Amber Lee Foundation's help, the chances of this ever happening again are minimal. And if nothing else, Denise will be forever remembered as being a part of a necessary change within the 911 industry. And thanks to her memory, countless lives have and will continue to be saved. Thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of True Crime Stories. If you enjoyed this video, check out this other interesting case I covered, and don't forget to subscribe. It's totally free and keeps you up to date with all of my future videos. You can also click that join button down below near the subs- You can also click that join button below to help support the channel and see new videos long before everyone else does. But my name is Ty Knotts, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.